are in listen only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, A Teachable Moment, Using 13 Reasons Why to Initiate a Helpful Conversation About Suicide Prevention and Mental Health, ho health I'm sorry, mm -hmm. hosted by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the American School Counselor Association, and the National Association of School Psychologists. Before we get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the webinar system that we're using today. When the webinar started, you heard that you were in listen-only mode, and this means that you won't be able to talk, but we do want you to participate. To ask questions and participate in the webinar, you can do so by typing in the questions section in the GoToWebinar menu on the right-hand side of your, of your screen. We'll address all questions at the end of the presentation. Additionally, you can download the handouts for today's webinar also in that GoToWebinar menu on the right. We're also recording this webinar, and you'll be able to view it later on on our website, schoolcounselor.org, AFSP.org, NASPonline.org. And we are happy to be joined by our speakers for today, Dr. Christine Moutier, Chief Medical Officer at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, Jill Cook, Assistant Director at the American School Counselor Association, and Dr. Kelly Valencourt Strobach, Director of Government Relations at the National Association of School Psychologists. And we're going to go ahead and get this webinar started today uh, by asking some polling questions just to gauge who we have on the call and the reason for attending the webinar today. So please take a moment to answer the polling question here. I am participating in this webinar related to my role as a it looks like we have some results coming in. Um, a majority at 85% are school psychologists or, or counselors, school counselors, um, with 15% or thereabout community members or mental health advocates. Um, we have 3% at school administrator and 1% um, for teachers. All right. Thank you for your response to that question. Next question here. I attended this webinar today because, so you don't understand um, the series and want to learn what the hype is about um, and con you're concerned about potential harmful effects of um, negative messaging, wanted to learn what, what more I can do to prevent suicide. Okay, good. We're having good results come in. We have about 52% concerned about the potential harm, um, and then about 40% want to learn more. So thank you so much for that. Next one here. Please take a moment to respond. All right, we're having a good mix. Regarding the issue, issue of suicide contagion, we have about 50%. They're well-versed in the research and why it is thought to occur. So that's good to hear with about another 50%. I believe it's real, but don't know why it occurs. Okay, the next one here. What challenges are you facing? in your role related to the series. All right, a majority of people are saying, I have been asked about it from other school professionals. Um, about 20% I have been asked by students about it, and another 20% I am not sure whether students should watch it or not. So that's good to, good to know as we go into this presentation. All right, and last one here. What program or efforts are happening currently in your school or community to support suicide prevention? Okay, we have about 60% offer programs on social skills, bullying, and or mental health. Oh, that's changed. It's actually pretty much across the, spread out across the board um, with the results to this particular question. All right, and we're going to go ahead and wrap up these polls. Thank you for responding. That helps the presenters tailor the um, conversation a little bit deeper. 
And now I'm going to hand it over to the presenters. You ladies now have the floor. Great. Thank you. Hello, and everyone. This is Dr. Christine Moutier, Chief Medical Officer at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and we are so happy that you've joined today's webinar, and I'd like to thank our partners at the American School Counselor Association and the National Association of School Psychologists for co-presenting this along with us. If anyone is having trouble seeing my slides, please let me know. Let me just look and make sure. Okay. okay. All right. So let's go ahead. So over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, we'll be presenting to you and really trying to leave some time for your questions um, so that we can respond to that and have a nice discussion at the end. But we will start by talking about some just framing uh, thoughts about the series, 13 Reasons Why, and why this is on everybody's minds at this point, and why there have been concerns raised. And then we'll just define the scope of the problem of youth suicide, give a little bit of grounding in terms of what the science tells us about risk and protective factors, recognition of warning signs, and then I'll turn it over to my co-presenters who will be talking about the school-based approach to suicide prevention and postvention. We'll wrap up by covering some tips for parents, um, both with regard to this series as well as if you're concerned about your child. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So this Netflix series, 13 Reasons Why, which was originally a fictional novel um, that came out in 2007, has really taken on a life of its own, as we all are experiencing and, and as evidenced by the fact that you all had the interest in, in attending this today because you're being asked um, so many questions about it and um, parents are looking for answers. And so we hope to just give you a little bit of framework for that. Um, because there has been quite a bit of sort of mixed messaging going on um, in the media and probably in just uh, informal conversations. So what I want to start out by saying is that contagion is a truly real phenomenon when it comes to suicide risk. And it's not that any um, portrayal of suicide or a student who's exposed to a peer's suicide, it's not that it elevates the risk of, of everyone involved. It's that for vulnerable youth who already have risk factors and may be in a state of, of increasing sort of burgeoning suicide risk, that it can connect with them in a way that can elevate their risk. And there are research study after research that shows that um, clusters and copycat suicides, as they're called, do occur after um, a peer suicide or after a suicide is portrayed in particular ways. And that is why the messaging around suicide and suicide prevention is so critically important. And so when it comes to 13 Reasons Why, um, as many of you already know, the plot and the production quality of the series is, is highly engaging. Um, and, and which is terrific for entertainment value um, and for an audience viewer to become so engrossed in, in a movie or in a show like that. But in this case, because it, um, I believe unintentionally, the producers um, really did kind of romanticize the suicide and um, that that is one of the reasons that contagion is, is a true concern here. Now, the other things um, to, to know are that many of the themes are both dark, extremely relatable, and, and engaging to youth. And that's another reason, I think, that they connect to the plot, is that so many teens, and adults for that matter, identify with those experiences that the main character, Hannah, goes through in the series. The shaming, the bullying, um, the, the backstabbing that she experiences, um, and the sort of feeling of shutting down and isolating and loneliness. Now, the other um, aspect of, that relates to contagion about the series is that it really portrays suicide, unfortunately, as the solution. It is the solution that she has chosen right from the get-go. Um, that's the frame that you start with, with this series and the novel. And it also simplifies suicide as a reaction to events, blaming peers. And that's, again, one of the premises is that 
um, after her death that her voice continues on and her and in fact in the series she keeps reappearing as the time element sort of goes back and forth with flashbacks and so forth and also because of the audio tape messaging so it really serves in a way to um, amplify that message of um, being able to have an impact after one's suicide death the other concern that we in the suicide prevention and mental health field have is that it is it, it has such an audience with youth and adults across the country and therefore the missed opportunities for important critical messages that can be preventive um, is a true loss it's a true lost opportunity and some of those messages would have included um, a sense that there are that we all have mental health, that mental health is along a continuum, a portrayal of that, that there's deterioration in mental health as those events are converging, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the peer group and, and the social setting. And um, that portrayal did not only not happen, um, but the series did also did not identify that mental health was even a factor leading up to um, Hannah's suicide and so again that's a that's a piece of the a major piece of missed opportunity in terms of prevention messaging alongside the fact that positive help seeking um, was not modeled the series unfortunately did not model what what we would view as really the ideal kind of preventive um, communal culture which is um, behavior and a sense of safe safe space where people are free to be authentic, at least with trustworthy people, where they can be vulnerable and share what's really going on, especially at those key times as a person is becoming suicidal. Um, so, um, and the, of course the graphic scenes add an additional layer of concern for both contagion, because the method um, is so graphically portrayed, and also for people who've experienced trauma um, to become activated. And so for all of these reasons, um, there is a real potential for suicide contagion to occur, and that is the reason that some of our guidance that you've seen out there um, by many of our organizations has really given a strong advisory against allowing youth who have a vulnerable history for, for suicide risk to even uh, watch it at all. And we'll get to some of that later. Okay, so very quickly, I'm going to fly through some of these um, defining sort of scope of the problem of youth suicide so that we can um, keep on, on time schedule. And you will have copies of the slides, so don't panic if, you know, I'm moving a little bit quickly here. So the takeaway in terms of the scope of the problem is that suicide is the second leading cause of death for American youth ages 15 to 24. Um, a total of about 6,000 young people in our country took their lives in 2015, which is the last time we have reported. And that, um, of course, is a humongous tragedy. Um, that averages to 15 individuals on a daily basis. So you need to know that, that um, this issue now has been raised in everybody's minds, but this has been going on. And what you see here is over the years from 2001 to 2015, um, you can see by age range in, our, in the United States what the rate of suicide looks like compared to the other ages and what, how, um, how it's been going over time in terms of the trends. And what, so the takeaway here is that for young people represented by that bottom blue line, they do thankfully have the lowest rates under age 20, and that the rates, while they've been um, fluctuating somewhat and, and unfortunately going a little bit in that wrong direction, certainly, overall much more of a steady state than, let's say, the middle-aged population represented by the purple line, where you can see that great elevation has occurred in middle-aged Americans' suicide rate over the last 15 years. This breaks it down by gender so that you can see from age 10 to 24, green bars are the males in each of those age categories, and yellow is the, are the females. And you can see that the rate of suicide is much higher for males than females, and this is true. Um, the separation begins in those adolescent years at around age um, tw 11, 12, 13, and that is true all the way through the life cycle, by the way, for, um, for most countries, um, and certainly is true for America. It's also true that females 
attempt suicide at a, at a higher rate than males, but um, males' death rate is much higher. Now, we also look at suicide along a continuum of, of, of mental health behaviors, becoming suicidal, having thoughts of suicide, making a plan, attempting, and, and then um, that tragic outcome of death. It's very important to know that, that attempts are, are extremely prevalent, um, even compared with suicide deaths. So for every youth suicide, it's estimated that there are between 100 and 200 youth who make an attempt. So that is an enormous number of, of young people in our nation every day showing up in emergency rooms and the parents, schools needing to respond in caring, compassionate, but appropriate ways so that they can get the help that they need. Um, and that number, 182,000 in 2015, really, um, which averages to about 500 young people per day, that includes both suicidal suicide attempts as well as non-suicidal um, self-injurious behaviors. There's also a, um, a youth risk behavior survey that you, you may know about if you work in a school setting for sure that looks at American youth um, ninth through 12th graders. Every couple of years this is done in most states in the United States. And one of the questions they're asked among a whole multitude of health-related risk type behaviors, like smoking, drug use, drinking, um, are thoughts of suicide and attempting suicide. And here you can see that in the previous year, almost 18% of our high school age students say that they have seriously considered attempting suicide. Almost 15% made a plan, and 8.6% um, say that they had attempted suicide one or more times in the last year. So the important thing to, to take away from all of that is that there is a baseline level of, of suicide risk that we need to learn to identify and get much, much smarter about. Now, I want to dispel one of the myths right off the bat, which is that sometimes when a young person attempts suicide, it's sort of written off as a manipulative gesture or a cry for help, quote unquote. And I want to just say that any suicidal behavior, including a suicidal ideation as well, is potentially life-threatening and must be taken seriously. It does not matter if they were trying to draw attention to themselves. In fact, that is probably a good thing if they're actually, if that is the only way they can think of to reach out for help. And that's one of the messages here is we need to find other ways to allow them to speak up to get the help they need without having to um, turn to suicidal behavior. Now, Let's talk a little bit about risk factors for teen suicide. We know that actually for all age groups, mental health is a very, very key component when it comes to suicide risk. And what the research tells us about the, the entire um, age range is that 9 out of 10 people who die by suicide have a treatable mental health condition at the time of their death. And that often flies in the face of the lost survivor who didn't realize that and didn't recognize it as such. Um, and this is, this is a, a challenge for us in our society because while we're opening up in our attitudes about mental health, we need to get even smarter about what are the treatable conditions when they actually show up because we don't often recognize them actually. We chalk it up to the stress of the day. So this lists out the seven mental health conditions that oftentimes um, can pile actually up on top of each other along with those life stressors um, and maybe some physical health problems as well or other, other types of um, risk factors and really create that risk for suicide. So if you have a student who's becoming depressed and they start to use substances more, and let's say they have a family history, a genetic risk for mood disorders, um, for suicide even in the family, or for addiction, those are all kind of part of that setup, the risk factors. Another really um, sad fact, again, we're getting smarter, but now we need to keep going with it and go deeper in our nation. Right now, only two out of three teens with depression um, Actually, two out of three don't get treatment for depression. So we're not very good at identifying it or realizing that it is a medical condition when it crosses over a certain line of, of depression and distress. The takeaway here is that mental health treatment can be very effective. It's, it's not the simplest thing to, um, to access or find, but you can find it. And I would encourage everybody, if, if you're if you're needing to do that at this time, either for your young person or for yourself, 
you can start with your primary care provider and start there and see if you can get a referral. There are also some resources on our website about how to find a good um, mental health provider. And the key is sticking with it and finding the treatment that works for you and finding a provider that will um, do that along with you. Now, it's not just about treatment. We also make choices in our own lives that have a lot to do with the way our mental health goes. And so here's just some examples of that. And this is a whole important topic of its own that I'm just going to kind of breeze right through. Now, just to cover a very, very basic understanding of what why does suicide occur? It can be so traumatizing and confusing when it does happen. And as a society, again, we have just not been smart enough about recognizing these risk factors because many of them show up long before the suicide occurs or even the crisis occurs. And if we can get better at identifying those mental health conditions, those psychological factors like perfectionism, high anxiety, being extremely hard on oneself, intolerant, black and white thinking, um, mostly unforgiving of oneself, and past history um, features like, again, a past history of suicide attempt, a family history of suicide, or of a mental health condition. What we've been where we're living right now as a society, I would say, is more like this. We look at the current life events. That's really, lar in large part, what we see. They had a breakup, um, a bad grade, financial stress, and then, and then their attempt happens or the suicide occurs. And the media in the past has been contributing, uh, inadvertently probably, to this incorrect view that I'm showing right now that something happens to a person in their life and then they take their life. Their risk escalates sort of out of the blue and they take their life. This is simply not how suicide actually occurs. Research has borne this out very, very clearly. And it's one of our concerns about 13 Reasons Why, that it, it does seem to promote this um, one cause and effect or the external events in one's life, the social, um, rather than all of those factors that we really um, need to become smarter about. So some practical things, identifying at-risk students. Many times mental health symptoms are confusing. Again, we need to understand that most adults and teens kind of cover up the distress that they're in. And so what shows up to the outside viewer, parent, teacher, peer, looks like mood swings, which can get chalked up to normal adolescent stuff going on, and, and we can talk about that later because that, that's not always simple, um, but there is an answer for that. It can look like laziness. It can look like they're having a bad attitude or that they've suddenly just kind of regressed into more an, a more immature state. All of those actually could be signs that a depression, an addiction, or an anxiety disorder is sort of um, coming on full swing. So. We've talked about those risk factors that tend to be there in place sometimes for a long period of time. Warning signs are, are different. Warning signs are the expression of their suicide risk that show up and, and signal more imminent suicide risk. And so again, I'm going to just fly through these. People say things that can tip you off. Sometimes it's in the form of a joke, and I think we need to be sure that, again, we're, we're not we tend to take things too lightly and say um, they were just joking, it's okay, it's because they're stressed for today, it's, this is what's going on. What is the harm in having a caring conversation? So these are some examples of the way people may speak that indicate their suicide risk as warning signs. Behavioral changes. And what I would say is that these are a lot of things. You can look, look at that list. If there are changes in what you know to be um, your loved one or your student's usual range of behavior. Um, we are, uh, hard to admit it sometimes, but rather predictable in terms of our temperament, our personality, our behavior patterns. We're within a certain range, even our sleep patterns, appetite, all of that. Um, and that all relates to our mental health. And when that starts to deviate outside that range, your gut instinct will probably tip you off. Of course, mood changes, but it's not just a down mood. You can also see people become much more irritable, rageful, angry. Um, and again, that looks very prickly. That, that does not look like an inviting sign to come in and help me. It tends to drive us away, so we need to be careful about that. There are lots of potential barriers um, that, that lead to that two out of three teens with depression not, not getting 
um, any form of, of professional treatment. And those can be that we simply aren't recognizing the symptoms for what they are, that they're signs of treatable illness. We fear the unknown, maybe, or, or, or myths that we've heard about treatment doing harm to people. Um, again, we can address that if, if that's a concern that you have. Um, a number of other things, feeling shame, ashamed and embarrassed, believing that adults won't understand, and this connects with 13 Reasons Why. The adults in, in this series are generally portrayed as adults who either don't get it, are sort of out to lunch or a bit clueless, or are frankly not helping at times when they should. So they're actually um, harmful in certain ways. And for the teen world, while adults can be viewed as sort of, you know, um, not a part of their world and not understanding of all of their, their um, insights uh, that, that heighten during that idealistic, te those teenage years, there is very good research that shows when teens know and believe that there are trustworthy adults who can handle um, things that are going on, that actually lowers the, that group of teen suicide risk. Very, very powerful research. And again, that's another missed opportunity um, in the series 13 Reasons Why. Okay, um, so I will just fly through some of these because we're going to actually come back to some of it in a moment. Um, so some important prevention strategies and protective factors are accessing effective mental health care when you need it and, and for your team. Fostering positive connections to those around them, including family, peers, community. Uh, creating safe and supportive culture in school, community, and home environment. Helping teens to cultivate problem-solving skills and keeping the communication very open and you know, without judgment or stigma, especially when it comes to life's challenges, distress, and mental health concerns. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jill and Kelly to talk about the school um, setting. Thank you so much, Christine. This is Jill Cook with the American School Counselor Association. And Kelly and I are gonna focus just a little bit on the role of the school per personnel in this process and in this issue, and we're going to specifically talk about some things that are available through the, the model um, district suicide policy that ASCA and NASP and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention um, compiled several years ago in conjunction with the Trevor Project. And um, as Christine said just a moment ago, many of the adults in the show did not respond in the most appropriate way. And, and for me in particular, in my association, the school counselor represented in the show certainly did not respond to Hannah in a way that was appropriate to uh, help her at that moment in time. So what we want to talk about is what the role of these school employed mental health professionals are and what these um, include are not just school counselors and school psychologists um, but also school social workers and sometimes school nurses are also included in this group of professionals. So school counselors, I know many of you on this are school counselors and school psychologists but so all have a common definition. School counselors work with all students in a school. Um, the profession has evolved over the last 10 to 15 years and it's not just working with a few who might go to college or a few in, who are in trouble. School counselors work with all students through a comprehensive, um, comprehensive school counseling program and address students' academic, personal, social, and career development goals and needs and that includes the post-secondary planning pieces as well and we work to promote the safe learning environments for the entire school community and can work on some of those issues that were mentioned before about um, bullying and interpersonal struggles or peer or friendship issues and the goal is to contribute to that positive school climate. And this is Kelly um, with the School Psychologist. Um, again, many of, many of you on this webinar are school psychologists, and I'm a school psychologist as well. And we um, oftentimes, school counselors and school psychologists are viewed as interchangeable, which is actually not the case. We are two very distinct professions who, although um, in the school setting, we certainly collaborate with one another and work together to meet the needs of all students. Um, school psychologists have additional expertise in mental health and behavior and crisis prevention. And we, again, we do work with all students. Um, like Jill said, the school counselor profession has evolved over the last 15 years. 
as has the profession of school psychology. Um, we do not just work with students in special education, um, which is a common misperception. We as well work with all students and teachers and administrators to really make sure that we are supporting the behavioral and mental health needs of students, as well as working with teachers and administrators to, um, and families to help them better support the comprehensive needs of students in schools. Um, and I do want to say, you know, to piggyback off something that Christine mentioned a minute ago, one of the reasons that we are focusing on the role of schools and the importance of school-employed mental health professionals is, like Christine mentioned earlier, you know, only two out of three young people with depression, um, sorry, two out of three young people with depression don't get help. Um, and this is, that's a common statistic if you look across all of the mental health um, issues that young people might face. But the majority of those that do receive help, they're, um, for the majority of those that do get help, their first access point is the school. Um, and so that is why it is so important to have school counselors and school psychologists and other mental health professionals who can both provide those services in schools but also to facilitate appropriate referrals into the community because we really know that schools have become almost um, the de facto mental health providers for many of our kids in many communities across the country. And we don't just want those professionals in the high school setting or the middle school setting. There need to be these professionals kindergarten through 12th grade um, to support students. And as Kelly mentioned, these professionals are so ideally positioned in a school setting to not only work with the students and the families, but the administrators and school staff and do have those community contacts and can make those connections and referrals. So these professionals, what we do in the school setting is identify those students who may be at risk, um, and including suicidal ideation. And that could be from our own interactions with students or from what a teacher or other educator in the building might notice and then if you have a process in place for communication about these kinds of issues might come back to the school counselor or school psychologist and say hey I have a concern what can we do um, school counselors and school psychologists certainly might provide um, short-term uh, counseling to students in the school setting but given that it is a school setting schools aren't set up to provide the therapy or long-term treatment and that's why those connections to outside agencies are so critical. And oh so critical is that connection with parents and families when there are students who need additional support outside of the school setting. And one of the, the biggest pieces will be to help train not just teachers, but all school personnel, whether it's the cafeteria worker, the bus driver, the custodian, anybody who has contact or connections with the student in the course of a day, um, to train them to recognize those warning signs that we saw a little while ago and then not only to identify those warning signs but then to understand the referral process within the school setting about where to go to get that student help. So if we're looking at the prevention side of this, one of the things that schools and districts should do is designate a suicide prevention coordinator at the district level and a principal should do this at the school level. This person might be um, the one who is in charge of the crisis team at the district or school level, but there needs to be somebody in place at both school and district with expertise and knowledge in suicide prevention who can not only be a resource but also um, respond if a situation arises. And also important is the annual professional development for staff on the warning signs and risk factors we looked at and how to respond. Um, and we need to think really in particular about those vulnerable populations, the LGBT population, um, students who might be in foster care, um, those who might have substance abuse issues or other, other issues that can impede their ability to be successful students in school. But this isn't just a one and done kind of um, professional develop, development. This needs to be ongoing so that all school personnel know how to respond. And then those folks in schools, the counselors, psychologists, social work, workers, and nurses, need to continue their professional development as well. And that's where our professional national organizations can come into play and the incredible resources available through AFSP. Um, and then 
we need to be able to do some of provide some content and information to students. Um, one way that can be done is through the health curriculum. Um, but one of the things school counselors can do because they work with all students through classroom guidance. One of the things school counselors do is go into all classrooms to provide information. So some of that information on um, healthy relationships to a identify warning signs, what to do if you're concerned about one of your friends. So we shouldn't be only educating other school staff, but it's also educating the students on what to look for and how they can help and what adults in the school they can go to when they do have concerns. And so when we're talking about intervention um, and looking back at a lot of the interactions among um, teachers and staff in the school, there were a lot of things that 13 Reasons Why, um, I guess I would say, did incorrectly. They didn't really, um, they didn't demonstrate best practices when we're, when we're talking about suicide intervention. And one of the most important things um, when you're looking at what schools need to have in place is a, a clear procedure for the assessment and referral for at-risk youth. So just like Jill mentioned, you know, you, it's very, very important in a school to have a point person, to have that coordinator so that teachers, um, families, administrators, um, and if it's developmentally appropriate um, students, need to know who in that school um, they can go to when they are concerned about a student um, expressing suicidal ideation. In a lot of cases, um, the person who is going to handle that, that intake assessment or the referral for at-risk use is a school psychologist, a school counselor, um, or another professional who's got some training and expertise in suicide, um, in suicide risk assessment. But whoever that person is, it is incredibly important that everyone knows who to go to so that um, students don't get lost in the shuffle, that there's not, there doesn't need to be a chain of command where, you know, three or four people have to be told about a concern for a student before they get help. There needs to be one person who would then be responsible for intervening. Um, and I think, too, with that, with that procedure, just, you know, Jill mentioned and Christine has mentioned this, the importance of educating not just teachers and students and other educators in the building, but also parents on the risk and warning signs of suicide and to make sure that teachers understand that any time a student expresses suicidal ideation, even though it might be presented um, in a way that is intended to be a joke or um, you know, you might not think that the student is actually being serious. It is incredibly important to take every single um, instance of suicidal ideation, even if you're not sure, um, err on the side of caution and take that seriously and be sure to, to approach the correct person in the building to make sure that they get help. That was one thing um, that throughout 13 Reasons Why, not just with the school counselor, uh, but with the parents and with some of the teachers, there were some signs that Hannah exhibited that she was, she vocalized a lot of the warning signs that Christine mentioned and they weren't taken seriously. And that is of utmost importance when we're talking about suicide um, prevention and intervention in the schools. You also want to make sure that the school has specific procedures for handling um, suicide attempts, both in the school and out of the school. And this includes not only addressing the mental and behavioral health needs of that particular student who has made the suicide attempt, but also um, of otherwise vulnerable youth in school who might be affected. Um, for a number of our students who are already struggling with their own mental and behavioral health needs or who have experienced a previous trauma, um, a suicide attempt, whether or not they witnessed it or whether or not it happened at school, can trigger um, a lot of mental and behavioral health needs in those, in those students. And so schools need to have a plan to make sure that they are addressing all of the affected people if there is a possible suicide attempt. And then importantly, um, for students that do have a mental health crisis, be it a suicide attempt or just a genuine real struggle with depression or anxiety or something else, um, oftentimes they may leave school for a while. Um, they might require outpatient care um, or some significant psychiatric intervention. And there needs to be a clear procedure when they come back into school for how we can best support them. And critical to this effort is ensuring that there is regular check-in with a school employed mental health professional, such as a school counselor or a school psychologist or someone else who might be working in the building, to make sure that we are monitoring that student and keeping a good check on their mental and behavioral health. 
Um, and this is just to, just to show you guys, uh, we've, we've mentioned a few times this model district policy on suicide, um, on suicide prevention. What Jill and I have talked a little bit about, um, and I'm going to mention again in terms of postvention, are some real policies and practices and procedures that schools should have in place because kids spend the majority of their time in school, and very often, um, especially for middle and high school students, um, peers, peers and teachers are often the first sometimes to notice suicidal ideation or some mental health concerns in children um, and children and youth. So it's incredibly important that um, for those of you that work in schools or and even those of you that do not, make sure you are kind of examining the existing policies and practices in place at your school to make sure that what Jill and I have mentioned in terms of appropriate prevention and intervention policies and procedures are in place. And if they're not, it's time for you to, you know, to sit down with the administrators um, and school employed mental health professionals like counselors and psychologists and social workers to make sure you get those policies and practices in place. And then lastly, um, we want to talk a little bit about postvention, you know, what to do after the fact. And again, this is an area where um, 13 Reasons Why didn't exactly portray what we would consider to be best practices in regards to suicide postvention. But in terms of the policies, incredibly important that you've got a crisis team. You know, Jill mentioned earlier you want to have a team in place for it's kind of a suicide prevention team. This, this team, the crisis, uh, the crisis prevention and intervention team might be that same person or might be that same team, but at a minimum, it really needs to include an administrator, school employed mental health professional, school security, and other appropriate personnel and make sure that they've got clear roles and responsibilities um, to how to handle um, what, you know, how to approach students, how to talk to families, and what really to do after you become um, aware of a suicide death. This team focuses on, you know, communications, dispelling rumors, uh, dealing with the media in a way that is responsible. But also one of the issues that comes up a lot, particularly after viewing um, 13 Reasons Why, and one of the things that schools tend to struggle with is what to do in terms of memorials. Um, you know, memorials after a student dies from suicide are very different in terms, um, they're very different memorials than what you might do from a student who died in a different manner. And there are a number um, of guidelines to follow. I'm not going to go through all of them um, in the, for in, uh, sake of time, but they're included in the handouts that we've given you. But it's very, very important that um, schools really do take seriously um, making sure that memorials, um, if you are going to choose to do one, do not glorify, highlight, or accentuate the suicide in any way. Um, as a way of preventing suicide contagion. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Christine. Great. Thank you so much, Jill and Kelly. So I'm going to just highlight a few things um, very, very quickly so we can get to your questions. But we've included a sampling of school-based programs that can be utilized to train teachers um, this one is called Science Matter that AFSP launched fairly recently for K-12 educators. It's purely online and really covers um, very much and more of, of what is in this webinar because it's very much geared to the school's um, response, delineation of roles, policies and procedures, even some legal um, boundaries and implications are covered in Science Matter. More than sad, is a program that many of you may be familiar with, our school-based program that has a module for parents, the teens themselves on depression, and um, school staff. And it's real a brand new program that AFSP recently launched for college students really modeling their uh, um, experience with mental health conditions and how they work through their own barriers and got help. So it follows six students. It's short. It's uh, meant for a youth audience. Um, even though it features college students, we can really envision it being utilized for juniors and seniors who are college bound. Now, I want to highlight one of the resources that is uh, it's a handout in this webinar. And it is uh, tips for parents for talking with their children about 13 Reasons Why and suicide. And if you'll just go ahead, and um, it's shown here, but it's so, so tiny. Um, it's there for you. you um, if you're in a position in your school 
to be able to uh, highlight this for your parent community, we would highly recommend it um, because it covers not only kind of some framework around 13 Reasons Why, but how to approach your child and um, some practical guidelines about that. Now, just um, in a very extremely abbreviated format, I'm going to talk about if you are a parent and you become concerned about your child, what you can do. And the first step is really being a role model, showing that anyone can face challenges, need help, get help, and that's the way to be smart and successful and, and maintain your health. Reaching out to anyone, but certainly your child, should be done in a very compassionate, um, sort of thoughtful manner. In private, do a lot of listening, express concern, support, tell them you're not judging. And if there's reason to, and I would say have a lower threshold than you think, ask them directly if they're having thoughts about suicide. That does not make a person worse. Um, someone who's not at risk, it will not affect them at all. And someone who is thinking of suicide, research shows generally find it in incredibly relieving to be able to talk about that, open up, stop carrying that burden of the secret, um, and realize that there is no shame and judgment and be able to get the help that they need. And then and so you need to help lead them to that help, of course. Trust your gut. We've talked about that already. Assume you're the only one. Here's some just little practical things. Try not to jump in. It's so hard as a parent um, or even as a spouse to not jump in with like your fix-it solutions and, and you know your kind of um, ways to uh, pep them up. It's not the time for that. Really listen and validate. Um, and here are some of the things we've already talked about, how to have that conversation. You, you kind of do have to prepare yourself and get yourself in a calm state of mind you, as a parent. It's very anxiety provoking to have your child going through this kind of crisis and you have to really ground yourself very solidly and be ready to just be anchored and listen and don't panic. If they're talking to you, that is a great sign that they're opening up and probably willing to have you lead them to help. Okay, if, they're, if you think they're um, at imminent risk of suicide, then there's an even um, different set of things to think about, including not leaving them alone and making sure that any potential lethal means are secured and not within their reach. Um, so that's very, very important. Okay, and um, here's some crisis lines. The crisis text line is a newer one that you can text and your teens probably are already texting. It's very popular among youth and it's a wonderful thing. Trained counselors who are texting. Um, and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, of course, is um, the lifeline is great both for people themselves who are in distress as well as for somebody who's trying to, um, you know, address another person who's in distress. They can help walk you through that and link you up with local resources. Okay, so let's go ahead and open up our Q&A time. Thank you so much for um, listening to us. All right, great, thank you. And we do have some questions that have come in, and we'll get to those now. Um, just bear with me a second. Okay, are there schools or districts where proactive curriculum and teacher professional development are taking place? If so, what curriculum is being used and what results have occurred? I'm not sure who wants to address that, but that's the first question. Jill or Kelly, I'm thinking that might be so, um, a good one for this you. Is, this is Kelly. Um, there are, I'm, I'm actually, I'm trying to look up um, the name of the curriculum that I know a number of districts in Virginia use, which is where I practiced. Um, it's called the Signs of Suicide, um, mm -hmm. which is a suicide prevention program for middle and high schools. And then with that, um, what what we did when I practiced was we also created a parent component so that not only were middle and high schools, uh, middle and high school students getting this, getting this information, we were also sharing that information with, um, with teachers. And although it's really hard to determine um, if as a result of that training, suicides go down because we didn't have a lot of suicides to begin with, but what we did see, um, which we thought was encouraging, was an increase in the number of self-referrals to the school counselor or the school psychologist. And so what that said to us was by educating students on the signs and symptoms of depression, anxiety, and suicide, um, 
peers were referring their, uh, their friends, you know, they were coming to the mental health professionals to express concern about their peers that they were worried about, and students were also self-referring themselves. Um, I know there are a number of really, really excellent um, additional suicide prevention programs that a lot of schools are using across the country. Um, I can't speak to the results of those, but I can speak to the ones from my own practice. And we did find it to be very encouraging um, in that uh, young people were reaching out to get help um, a greater extent than they were before we did the program. And to add to that, Kelly, this is Jill, and when you do present a curriculum such as the SOS curriculum to students, one of the things that the schools need to plan for and be prepared for is that increased referral from self or from students um, because that can sometimes create a capacity issue. So knowing that you might have a bump in that, you just want to make sure you're prepared to address all the concerns and issues that may arise. But there are a number of other really great programs being used in schools that we can um, try to make available on the website where we post this webinar if you guys, so people can look through them. All right, great. Can you please address ways to use the show to talk about suicide to students? Maybe I'll just start very briefly. This is Christine. I would be uh, very careful, um, as you may have noted when I talked about the program more than SAD, the teen part of the program for students, that curriculum, actually kept the focus around the upstream distress factors and help seeking and trying to dispel myths and take the stigma out of getting treatment and talking to trustworthy adults and counselors um, and so forth. And so uh, um, if you're going to have if you're going to introduce the topic specifically of suicide, you need to look at the safe messaging guidelines, make sure that you're always framing suicide not just as this big problem. We never use the word epidemic. We don't talk about escalation. We keep the the sort of anxiety around it very well framed in, in what it, what the data shows, um, which which I had showed you earlier, which is it's a it's a tragic and preventable cause of death, but it is actually not escalating, particularly among youth. Um, thankfully, again, it's not to say it's not that any death is, is too much, but every time you raise the topic of suicide, you must pair it with a message of prevention and hope, and how every the message is everyone in the world, um, you, the people you most highly respect face challenges of all sorts, and many of us, that includes distress um, that leads us to think about suicide, mental health challenges, and there is simply no shame in addressing those in a proactive way. So, and then, you know, of course, you build that out and actually have ways to have your, your words um, be matched by the actions that they see around them, role modeling in, in that school. The culture change piece is, is really, it's harder, but it's very, very important. And I would argue, too, that if you are going to have this conversation with students, um, that you also make sure to reinforce um, the message that there are trusting adults in the school that kids can and should turn to, um, and to kind of do, do the best that you can to dispel um, and negate the portrayal of the adults and the counselor um, in the show, because that, that sends the message that mental health professionals in the schools are going to be dismissive um, of their concerns as quote-unquote typical teenage problems, where what we really need to be saying is that these are the adults in the building here so you can go to to help, and they really are there to help you. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, as a clergy, are there helpful ways that faith, faith communities um, can address feelings of hopelessness, despair, and isolation? I think there's a, this is Christine, there's a really important role of clergy and faith-based leaders when it comes to suicide prevention. Because if you think about um, the, our population and the percentage of them who are likely to open up and share their real struggles and concerns with a pastor or a clergy, um, a mentor in their faith-based community or just in their general community, it's probably 
higher, unfortunately, in some ways than it is that they recognize when it, again, when it tips over into illness that requires treatment, that even just starting with their primary care doctor. So I think the key thing for the faith-based leader community is to really um, think about the full spectrum, understand that it's not just about the people who become um, suicidal or who attempt or who have died or have experienced loss. There's a whole spectrum of, of um, life factors, and, and I'd ask you to think about the frame on from a mental health standpoint. I know you know we all have our lens through which we see the world, but to integrate that with with the faith-based viewpoint. And there are now some programs that are actually specifically designed for faith-based leaders and communities. One that we've become familiar with is called Soul Shop, um, that really does a very nice job of not only providing some education, but gives some skill, a little bit of gatekeeper training um, and, and role models that some of the leaders are, are faith-based leaders themselves. Okay, great, thanks. At what age do you recommend beginning specific targeted suicide prevention training for students? I wouldn't start suicide prevention, well, it depends on how you define suicide prevention education, because again, I think you could start in kindergarten and first grade with some very healthy social, emotional skills, coping strategies, peer-based, you know, modeling, all those things that are very, very proactive, um, positive, kind of um, the strength-based model. And then moving um, up into the later years, you start not only teaching about health conditions, I think teaching about mental health conditions in health class or in PE is fine and a good thing to do, but it shouldn't be the only thing you're doing. That sends a very limited message about what this, what mental health is really all about and the full spectrum and how dynamic it is. We can become so much smarter about that. So I would say high school and older most certainly and um, as I mentioned before, I'm even cautious about the high school years only because it can be done in, um, inadvertently in a way that actually um, does more harm than good. So just make sure you pick your program um, you know, really well and your curriculum really well. And I, I wouldn't have a class as a standalone. I would start with your policies and procedures and, again, the role modeling and the culture change and build your curriculum as one piece of that. All right, thank you. Uh, and I did want to acknowledge that we do have uh, social workers on the line and that they do play an important role. Did anyone want to speak to that as well? Well, I think Kelly and I early on when we talked about all this school-based personnel, um, even though it's school counselors and school psychologists represented here, certainly those personnel also include the school social workers and the school nurses often. And, and when we talk about school-based mental health personnel, it includes all of those professions. And while each plays a little different role in how we support students and staff and families, um, we're all there to support the, the student. And I would say, too, just as an, as an advocacy plug for those of you that are doing this kind of work in your communities, um, in an ideal world and really in best practices, every school would have one of each of us. You would have a school counselor, a school psychologist, a school social worker, and a school nurse. And unfortunately, the reality across the country is that schools might have access to one or none of us on a regular basis. And so I would just encourage all of you doing work in your schools and communities to, especially around suicide prevention, to work with administrators and work with the people that set aside money to hire personnel to make sure you've got that full team available for every school and every student. Great. Yes. Thank you. School nurses as well. Yes. Uh, okay. Can we talk about specific physical signs to look for other than appearance? such as changing or appearance changing or marks on their arms, et cetera? In terms of suicide risk? Yes. Sure. So um, again, I would start very high level and say trust your gut instinct, that when the pattern starts to change, something, something in your radar 
will get tweaked. And um, just a, just one thing on that, I think one way to look at this time frame we're living in right now in this period um, shortly after this Netflix series has launched is that if risk has been elevated for a certain layer of our vulnerable youth, we have an opportunity now to really dial up the sensitivity gauge of our radar so that, that we don't dismiss that little gut tweak that happens when you notice that change. So really, it's a whole, it, it can look different in different students, but I would say um, a different sort of facial affect where they either appear very preoccupied, agitated, withdrawn, they're isolating, they're not with their usual friend group. And again, um, you know, this is of course in the balance of things, we can all have an off day where we're, um, you know, just not quite on track. But again, I would, I would point to most people who have that, that sort of um, intuitive sense of when it's in the range of that's a normal range or that is tweaking me as going outside the range and especially if it's in a pattern of behavior. So you're seeing it not just on one day, but now it's the week later and they still don't seem like they've kind of come back into their normal space of either appearance, behavior, um, mood. And, um, and again, I think the whole idea here is that it, it would be one thing if it, if it were a big ask, but all you have to do is set up a one-on-one -on -one brief conversation with them and open up a, an opportunity to care and to listen. Okay. Can you address how the risk for suicide increases because of the way teens watch TV, such as binge watching the show? I really think it has it's a serious part of what we're living in this day and age, even just thinking about how information overload and access to everything under the sun, video, audio, um, news, graphic material, it is, they're bombarded. Um, and so again, for the, um, for the healthy young person who's in a good state of health, mental health, that can have some level of impact, potentially, but for those who have risk factors, they may not even be, um, you know, in a state of crisis or, or ill health at the time, but those risk factors can really be quite latent. We talked, I alluded to genetics. I mean, um, that's, we can be so much smarter about what that latent sort of risk looks like. So I really think it has a lot to do with that, that bombardment and that overload that I mentioned, you know, with 13 Reasons Why, there's this intense sense of engagement and connection to the plot, to the themes, um, to the what she's doing. And again, the element of mystery that each episode reveals more information, you're sort of kind of strung along like that. All of that leads to this connection, the intense connection for the vulnerable individual, yes. Um, I think I think the binge watching what it does in addition is that your your brain doesn't have a chance to process and and kind of get the information filed away in the healthiest possible way and processing can do that and that I by processing I just mean talking it through or journaling about it self-reflecting but most most of us do best with talking it through with um, a significant other, a trusted friend, a mentor, or a therapist, um, or of course in the school setting, a counselor, a school psychologist, a teacher. Um, so that's why in our recommendations and our tips for parents, we talked about um, not binge watching, offering to watch it with your um, healthy child, and really just opening up open conversations after you finish an episode and not diving right into the next one, ideally even, like spacing them out. All right, and we're going to uh, address a couple of more questions here. We're good for about six more minutes. Next question. Could you talk a little bit more about how to deal with talks of the show in the school setting? Jill, I think that might be people talking about the show. Um, I think... I think for uh, school staff, so putting on a to, okay. talk, mm -hmm. to talk about the show with their students. Mm. 
That's a good one. So I think, uh, Hello, this is Kelly, Kelly one um, important thing to consider um, if, because we, we know this is, we know this topic is coming up in schools because our young people are watching it, um, is to make sure, you know, we, we've mentioned this before that, you know, all of our organizations have some guidance, but before, you know, if teachers are wanting to proactively bring this up in their classrooms, it's incredibly important that they are aware um, that this show really isn't appropriate for some of our more vulnerable youth. So they need to be aware of maybe some of the mental health or trauma histories of the students in their classroom um, before they begin talking about this. But also it's incredibly important as well for them to have a good understanding of what suicide risk looks like um, and who the right people are in the classroom, um, in the school um, to talk about this are before they, before they have these conversations because what we're hearing is this, these conversations are dredging up um, important conversations that need to be had, but they're bringing up, you know, feelings in teenagers um, that really do mm -hmm. indicate some, you know, levels of risk in some of our youth. But I think one of the most important things, too, is to keep the conversation or to steer the conversation in, in, as much as possible towards um, reinforcing those resiliency factors that can lessen the potential of the risk factors that our students might face. And so having conversations around the importance of engaging with your family support um, or faith-based communities or your peers if you're, if you're struggling with mental health, um, depression or anxiety, reinforcing the need for maintaining positive um, connectedness to your school and community, helping students you know, understand the importance of um, appropriate conflict resolution and teaching them adaptive coping and problem-solving skills and just really keeping the focus not so much on here are all the problems that you're facing, which certainly is important to address, but give them, give them some tools on how they can more effectively cope with the issues um, that we know our young people are facing. And if this is a conversation that teachers do want to have with students, then it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity to engage those school-based mental health personnel to be a part of that conversation and to participate and then offer guidance to the students and the staff. And then kind of uh, related to that, do you recommend proactively bringing up the show uh, during, for example, suicide prevention programs for youth, or do you think it's best to just discuss it if they bring it up themselves? But our associate, this is Kelly um, with the School Psychologist, um, we don't recommend encouraging youth to watch the series um, because of all the cautions and concerns that, that, um, that, that we've raised. But I do think if, so if students proactively bring it up, I think it's okay for, for teachers to talk about it. But I would, I would caution against encouraging um, students to watch this as part of a curriculum. And I feel the same way, it's Christine. I, I, I think certainly responding to their questions, it's on their minds, that again presents an opportunity to have a really good conversation, um, little teaching moment or role modeling moment. But to, to bring it up proactively kind of implicitly says, this is, our, this is our piece on suicide prevention. And I've even heard of some schools thinking about showing parts of it as part of their suicide prevention curriculum. Um, the book has been on some of the school's reading lists and things like that. And I know that the book's content is, is quite a bit different. Um, all of that said, I just think the the cautionary tale here is, um, which maybe the show meant to be in terms of walking away with positive lessons, and and some youth are talking about that. But the risks are are extremely real, and there are wonderful ways to um, talk about mental health, help seeking, a trustworthy, safe community. Um, how the school responds to students in need and, and the positive messages, um, there are ways to do that without having to frame it around this series. And I think what this, whether it's about the show specifically or not, one of the things that's been stressed today is the importance of open communication between all 
all parties that deal with young people, whether it's the school, the clergy, community organizations, parents, siblings. Um, I would hope that we can use this conversation conversation and move ahead and have these conversations as a community, as a school community about all we can do to support students and, and make sure that they have the capacity and the support they need to be successful in school and out of school. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And we are at that time now to wrap up. I did want to, in the last couple of minutes, if you have not already downloaded the handouts for the presentation today, please be sure to do that. Um, and that is in the handouts tab of the GoToWebinar menu on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and then I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you also to um, Kelly, Jill, and Christine for the presentation. I wanted to remind everybody that we we did record this webinar today, so you'll be able to listen to that um, from our website. We'll, our websites, we'll be posting that to each of our websites within the next day or so. Um, again, that's schoolcounselor.org, AFSP.org, and NASPonline.org. So please um, be sure to check those out there and share with your colleagues as well. Thanks, everyone, again, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.